yes, I'm Tavis Lomdi from Google, um, and this is my talk. Um, so basically, uh, I'm going to be talking about some ideas that we've been using in, in uh, uh, exploring at Google to do with uh, fuzzing. Um, uh, the general idea is that while uh, a lot of research is, is, uh, is, being, uh, is being named at fuzzing, uh, in general, this is towards making uh, smarter fuzzers, making them have better understanding of the protocol and states that a program uh, 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 can get into. Um, so, but uh, we generally consider this idea that might be uh, the wrong direction, and that, we, that uh, more research should be put into making software generically um, less smart and um, uh, removing uh, uh, the, the protocol that it supports and just making it uh, just a, a stream of bytes that's no different from uh, 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 just reading random data. Um, so yes, I've been calling this making software demo as opposed to making fuzzers smarter. Um, so in its purest form, fuzz testing is really entirely blind to context and the protocol. Um, as it was originally designed by, uh, um, uh, and documented in, uh, I think it was the 70s, by uh, Barton Miller and, uh, uh, and colleagues, um, it was basically just output a, a stream of random data and pipe it into random Unix commands and see what happens. Um, so surprisingly, this always turned out to be remarkably successful. Um, but it's self-evident, really, that you can't apply this to anything more than the most basic, uh, the most basic software. Um, originally, it was piping random data into things like grep and orc and so on, seeing what happened. Um, but clearly, that's not going to be much use against a web server that requires um, um, a full protocol uh, header and so on before it uh, does anything at all. Um, so. Applying these, the core principles that made fuzz testing so useful in it, uh, when it was designed has been, uh, um, it continues to be an active research topic and trying to apply these principles to uh, more complex software. So the earliest attempt at introducing uh, structure to fuzz testing was probably block-based fuzzing. Uh, and using this system, you basically define data structures that the protocol understands or the, or the program uh, will pass. And these are called blocks. And then the fuzzer will basically assemble blocks in a random order or mutate them or uh, break whatever rules you've defined. Um, and this way, it, try, it has some basic. Uh, it has some uh, basic way of communicating with the program, and it can try and break it this way. Um, the most notable example was Spike uh, by uh, Dave Vitale, um, and who, of course, broke at the time broke pretty much everything. Um, I think he's most famous for probably the uh, the uh, Microsoft RPC stuff, and also IIS and thing and uh, some other things. Um, another way of uh, uh, extending fuzz testing to um, apply to uh, uh, more complex protocols is uh, model inference assisted fuzzing. Uh, basically, with model inference assisted fuzzing, you have a, um, um, a detailed protocol specification, usually in the form of something like um, um, a BNF for the protocol. Uh, and then the fuzzer will uh, pass this specification and generate um, uh, protocol streams that break these specifications in some, in some um, uh, subtle way to try and explore uh, the Pokemon attack surface and break it in, uh, in interesting ways. Um, so once it's passed the specification, it's, it, it can deviate subtly from the specifications, and this is where interesting bugs are found. Um, so model inference assisting fuzzers continue to expose serious implementation flaws in lots of software. Um, the, most notable, the most notable example at the moment is probably Protoss. Uh, these guys, I think they're from, uh, from uh, CertFI. Um, uh, they produce test suites now and then for various protocols using this method. And uh, when they release, they, they, they tend to break quite a lot of stuff that, uh, that uh, it's aimed at. Uh, they release things like HTTP test suites. And um, I think recently they broke uh, zip and other compressors. Um, it's pretty cool stuff. So um, model and payment assisted fuzzing is, is obviously a leap forward from just uh, the uh, uh, devy random stuff that uh, fuzz testing uh, began with. But uh, reliance on protocol, on accurate protocol specification, is a number of, presents a number of problems. Um, it's expensive to write this, to write these specifications. Um, if you're lucky, the uh, the vendor will provide a specification, or it'll be available in the RFC. But in general, these are pretty useless because um, they don't follow a strict format. In RFCs, they generally use augmented BNF, but um, they t whenever, there's, whenever there's something that's particularly hard to describe in BNF, they tend to just put a comment and explain something in English which obviously isn't much use. Um, I think one of the harder things is in ABNF that it's impossible to say you want a complement of something. So you can't say uh, this could be anything except for this, everything from this set apart from this. Uh, so people just tend to write that in English, um, which is obviously useless and impossible to pass. Um, 
Another problem with this is it's only really possible to model the specifications that uh, the vendor has documented. If there are some undocumented features or um, debugging features, um, or you're fuzzing an HTTP server based on the RFC, but it supports some, uh, some uh, proprietary features that the vendor hasn't documented, then you're pretty much in trouble because there's no way you're gonna touch this stuff. Um, and this is unfortunate because this is where a lot of the bugs are gonna be uh, in, uh, in uh, the, the stuff that's uh, not touched by many clients. Um, there's also a problem that if you're using, for example, um, and the HTTP specification to fuzz an HTTP server, then you, if the web server you're fuzzing doesn't support uh, something like DAV, then you're gonna be wasting a lot of time fuzzing this stuff because, um, I mean, a large portion of the protocol describes this stuff. So you're basically just gonna be hitting a very small amount of code um, and not getting much uh, fuzzing done. So, um, so a possible solution to this has been um, the introduction of feedback-driven fuzzing. So feedback-driven fuzzing attempts to monitor the application as you're fuzzing it and learn um, which parts of the code you're touching. So this is really cool because you can basically see what kind of coverage you're getting at runtime and uh, the fuzzer can make some decisions about what kind of code to touch. Uh, if it can see it's going down a particular path, it can try and continue down this path to reach some leaf node or something like that. Um, so most implementations that I'm aware of will uh, either use things like uh, F instrument functions in GCC, which is a nice feature that um, allows you to define callbacks when new functions are called. It installs this at compile time, so that whenever a function is called, it'll uh, call your, uh, your callback. Or using, uh, alternatively, you might use DBI, uh, dynamic binary instrumentation. So at the moment, there are three major DBI frameworks in use. There's a pin tool from Intel, which is uh, some pretty cool technology, but it's available for Linux and Windows, but unfortunately, it's, it's uh, proprietary. And Dynamo Rio, which until recently was, um, was proprietary, but then I've released it under a very uh, liberal license, which is pretty cool. Um, and uh, it's uh, pretty exciting stuff. Uh, there's also uh, Libvex and Valgrind from Julian Seward from the Valgrind project, um, which uh, has, it's, uh, because it's uh, open source, it's uh, quite useful on Unix platforms, uh, whereas the only other alternative was uh, PIN or Dynamo Rio, which were proprietary until recently. Um, on Windows, it's also quite popular to use uh, homebrew techniques, which is generally writing an, um, an ID script to uh, uh, spit out uh, uh, basic block boundaries and then uh, insert uh, software breakpoints at runtime and then just use uh, the uh, wait for debug event thing that uh, Windows provides. Um, it, it does the same job and it, uh, it, and it works. Um, and it's also, it generally performs better than DBI as well, so if that's, a, if that's something you're interested in, it's quite useful. Um, some notable examples of feedback-driven fuzzing are Bunny the Fuzzer by El Um He used uh, F-instrument functions from GCC and uh, EFS from Demot, um, which is an uh, evolutionary fuzzing system, I think. Um, and he used uh, basic uh, hill climbing and, uh, and uh, feedback to try and uh, improve fuzz coverage. Um, so this has proven to be pretty effective and it's really exciting stuff. Um, to be able to sort of uh, design this into a fuzzer and uh, see what kind of um, stuff we can do. Um, so I've been convinced that model inference assisted fuzzing is useful and perhaps a useful way to go uh, in uh, trying to fuzz more interesting software. Um, but it's still really expensive to set up. You still got to put a lot of, lot of effort uh, defining these specifications. Um, and uh, and uh, how it should interact with the, with the software that you're trying to fuzz. So I've been working on an alternative solution that I'd like to replicate the, um, uh, the same uh, kind of success of uh, model inference assisted fuzzing, but without, the, uh, without this overhead. So um, I've been trying to use this to explore uh, proprietary software and undocumented features and, uh, and uh, to explore interesting features of software that perhaps hasn't been touched by fuzzers before. Um, it's also useful for, as, as the Protoss project approved, they've been able to generate, uh, automatically generate test suites for, uh, for programs that apply generically and, uh, and uh, tend to find bugs even if they haven't looked at the, the original software. Um, and uh, I've been able to generate pretty good uh, quality regression test suites just uh, using these techniques. Um, uh, so I've been using this method to find, uh, to find real security problems and I've been able to break quite a lot of stuff this way. So uh, inspired by these ideas, things such as uh, Protoss, CFS, Bunny, uh, Sage from uh, Microsoft Research. Um, uh, Microsoft never released Sage, by the way, they did, but they published a paper on it, which sounded pretty cool. 
Um, it's uh, pretty much required reading if you're uh, interested in uh, sort of uh, the future of fuzzing. Um, so initially, uh, in order to get feedback to doing fuzzing, I simply hooked GCC's built-in GCOV support. So GCOV is GCC's um, coverage and instrumentation uh, backend. It, um, it's not supposed to be exported, but um, because obviously it def uh, all, the, all the, the source code is easily available and uh, the, uh, the symbol is exported, you can simply uh, override um, uh, these symbols and uh, use them yourself. Basically, at runtime, uh, they pass you um, uh, every object uh, file, passes you a structure, and you can make a linked list out of them, and then you can, it points to things like counters and so on. Um, it's uh, really useful. Um, GCC then modifies every basic block in the program to increment a counter, and then you can, uh, when you get back, when you get control back, you can see which counter was, uh, was incremented and, uh, which, uh, and what code has been touched. So it's really fast, it's really, you know, it's, uh, it's, um, it works at the basic block boundary, and you can get all kinds of great information from it. Um, so this works, and it, it's, uh, it's, uh, and I found it uh, perfect for my use. But unfortunately, the only um, the drawback is that it'll only work with uh, software that I've got the source code for, and uh, it's generally it's mostly pretty uh, Unix specific. You can use it on Windows as well. GCC is obviously available for Windows, but it's uh, the support is pretty limited for the, some of the for some of the stuff. Um, and so, as the DBI framework is a cross-platform, I basically get Windows support for free once I've uh, implemented this code. Um, so I've been able to apply a lot of my ideas to Windows as well, even though I'm pretty much a Unix person. Um, using uh, because I use the, these cross-platform DBI frameworks, I could get these to work on Windows very easily. So the idea that I've been starting with is called corpus distillation. So inspired by the idea of infamous assisted fuzzing, corpus distillation basically uh, is an idea to try and rebuild the protocol specification just by uh, observation of the software. So um, the realization that brought this on was really that if you consider um, any program or um, any input um, to be basically just a set of elements from the, from, the, from the universe of source code lines that make up the program, um, then you can define any input as, uh, as a set of these lines, like the, input, the, um, the blocks or source code lines that it touches as it's, uh, as it's processing this input. So you consider. Um, so using, uh, uh, so using this idea, you consider that the input, set, input X is basically just a subset of lines from the program that you're executing. Um, and then we can apply some uh, interesting set theory to this and uh, do some cool stuff with it. So Sage from Microsoft Research, as I mentioned before, had some similar goals to this. They also wanted to generate test suites. Um, but they approached it in a much different, uh, in a much different way. They basically um, uh, uh, used uh, constraint solving um, to try and rebuild uh, the, how the uh, the program was working, but uh, I wanted to avoid this. Um, I'll explain why later. So basically, if uh, this is my uh, pretty rubbish diagram, uh, if uh, the program, if the program that uh, executes these lines while you're processing uh, uh, an input, then we consider this input basically the set of those lines, and it, the contents of the of the input don't really matter. It's uh, it, it's just a, a set of octets, and who cares what they are? I do, all I need to know is that uh, that the, when the program is decoded, when the input is decoded, these lines are executed. And yeah, now I can use simple set theory to manipulate, to manipulate the corpus in interesting ways. So basically how I did this was, um, my technique was basically to collect uh, a lot of samples from the public internet. Um, so obviously Google's in a, in a, in a unique uh, uh, position in that we can do this very quickly because we've already got a large calling infrastructure. But uh, obviously that's kind of cheating from my perspective and that wouldn't be much use to anyone else. So I implemented my own caller uh, they just needed to use simple LWP simple um, and using the public APIs that Google exports so anybody could reproduce this. Um, so yeah, I envisioned a small scale crawling of the public internet to collect a, a, cor a sample corpus. So one of the first things I wanted to test was um, HTTP responses. And so I did this by just by uh, um, requesting pages from public HTTP servers and, and collecting them, uh, monitoring how uh, these affected uh, various web browsers or uh, uh, clients. Um, I started with Internet Explorer because it, uh, I had, at this point I just got uh, cross-platform support to work. Uh, and straight away I found uh, uh, some vulnerabilities. Uh, these happened to be some very old bugs that had existed since um, I think IE3, IE4, uh, and they still existed in IE8. And even though the numerous people had published um, attacks that were against Internet Explorer that had used uh, HTTP fuzzing, nobody had found these bugs, even though they were pretty trivial. Um, and uh, I explain the reason for that in a minute. But uh, 
using this data that I collected, I was able to infer data about the protocol being tested uh, without even knowing what the protocol was. So this is one of the examples I found in Internet Explorer. Um, so while calling the public internet for HTTP responses, an IES machine responded with HTTP 1.1 449 retry with, um, and included the HTTP response header MS echo reply. So um, I'd never heard of this before. Even uh, uh, nobody I spoke with heard of this before. Searching for this stuff, uh, it didn't appear to be documented at the time. Uh, and searching for it on Google to draw a blank. Uh, it seemed to be an undocumented feature of Internet Explorer, but. Um, but when I passed this to, uh, to IE and uh, got the coverage score, having this uh, included uh, absolutely increased the, the coverage score. So it was clearly doing something. Um, and it was hitting some new code that hadn't been touched before. So it turned out that, uh, that uh, just trivial mutation of this input uh, revealed some easily exploitable conditions. It turned out that if I truncated the, uh, um, the response, um, some object that contained the HTTP headers was freed, but a reference remained to it in another object. And, and you could request this object in from, uh, you could request a similar sized buffer in JavaScript, and then once it's assigned to you, it's obviously game over, just a club of the V table or something, and it's, uh, you can redirect execution. Um, so uh, this bug was, as I mentioned, was really old. I think it was, um, uh, I've put IE4 here, but I'm pretty sure it was in IE3 as well. Um, and this bug had managed to evade several other fuzzes that, uh, um, People had documented that they'd been fuzzing HTTP and IAS and IE and all kinds of stuff, and they'd never found this bug. So I think this is pretty obviously because it was undocumented, and people just hadn't been feed, uh, feed, uh, seeding their fuzzes with these strings. Um, I didn't have to do this. I basically just encountered it in the wild. Noticed that it actually, I didn't have to go through this manually. It, I noticed that the coverage score increased in IE. And uh, I added it to my corpus of uh, H interesting HTTP responses, and uh, yeah, it was trivial to pwn. So, and I've also discovered uh, lots of other bugs like this. This is just a, a single example in uh, lots of other web browsers, um, including uh, uh, Chrome, our internal browser, before it was released. This, I applied this technique, and uh, we found lots of bugs, including um, at the time, I think we were using Microsoft WinHTTP stack, and I wrote this several times as well, uh, and our own internal, uh, um, uh, internal build, which is uh, in, not based on WinHTTP. So another example that I found using this, I also collected a corpus of image data and used libpng to generate a corpus. So uh, this was a nice vulnerability that I found that affected lots of web browsers. Um, so when decoding a PNG, it would uh, try to allocate uh, an array of pointers to row data, where it would store image data, obviously. Um, uh, and uh, it was just a, a code pattern like this, where it did uh, uh, an array of pointers and then malloc to some data. Uh, but if an allocation never occurred, uh, which you could easily do by specifying insane uh, dimensions of the image, it would try to allocate a huge buffer. That would fail. Um, it tried to clean up after itself. Once it reached this section of the code, it set a flag saying that row pointers have been allocated. Uh, even if, uh, but if, I, uh, if the allocation started to fail halfway through, then only half of the pointers would be allocated. The rest would be uninitialized. Well, it turns out that I could easily control what was in that data. Uh, what was in the, uh, these unallocated row, point, uh, uh, row pointers. So uh, all I had to do was, um, was uh, initialize this data using a primary image that did a decode before this run. And then I could basically just free at an arbitrary address whatever I wanted. So it, this, was, uh, this was possible to exploit as well. It, uh, rather than uh, attacking the system allocator, which although possible is pretty hard work, all I had really had to do was find an interesting object that I could view in my address space, uh, free that, and then try to get it, try to assign it to a buffer I like it in JavaScript, and uh, then I control this buffer that is uh, it uh, wasn't expected to be freed at this point, and uh, it's game over. Uh, so uh, lots of uh, web browsers and of course other PNG clients were affected by this. So. Using a simple set cover minimization, I'm able to take a very large corpus of say. Um, I don't know, um, uh, 20 gigabytes worth of HTTP sample responses, uh, find out which of these uh, touch, new, uh, touch new code, and then find the minimal uh, set of these, uh, of these samples that do something interesting. So uh, this is found rather than treating a program as uh, a, set of, a stream of octets, which Miller et al. Uh, uh, did during their uh, early uh, work on fuzzing, or simple data blocks. I, uh, I treat them as a set of uh, elements from the uh, set of source code lines or basic execution blocks from the, uh, from the program to be tested. So now all I have to do is calculate the cardinal uh, cardinality of this large corpus and then uh, find the smallest subcollection 
so that the, the union of those uh, inputs still has the same cardinality. Um, this is uh, an NP-hard problem, but um, I don't really need it to be optimal or complete. It just has to be uh, uh, a simple approximation, which is uh, trivial to do. Um, uh, there have been uh, uh, numerous algorithms uh, published that do this. It's, uh, it's not that difficult. So uh, my initial results were pretty encouraging. Um, I was able to find lots of bugs and break some high-profile software um, uh, that other people had already tried a fuzz and uh, hadn't found anything. Um, so it was also the case that just simple mutation, uh, flipping simple bits, uh, would break most software. Um, as I explored a nearby error path to this, to, as each image was interesting, it touched some code that another image didn't. Just uh, flipping random bits would hit nearby error paths that hadn't been touched before a while, and uh, this would often ex uh, expose some uh, interesting software that could break pretty easily. So and another interesting fact was that if I generated a corpus using something like lib, uh, libpng or libjpeg or something like that, um, as I touched all the error paths in this, in this program and tried it on another uh, uh, implementation, such as if I used libpng and then tried to decode the pngs with Microsoft's uh, GDI, then uh, program B would break um, without any modification at all. Um, this would be because program A had some error check in it that the, the, other, the, other, um, the other program didn't, and once I hit that code, uh, things would go wrong. So using a combination of uh, corpse distillation and flare, which is um, uh, another first framework that I'll talk about, um, produced yet more breakage, and uh, we were able to cut the time to use Flayer, which is quite a manual process at the moment, uh, and without requiring the overhead of constraint solving. So, um, so yeah, this proved to be a useful way of proving that all the cases, um, cases and errors handled in one program were also handled in another. So I'd use an open source library and then try that against Microsoft's library and then see which one of those broke. Um, so if Microsoft didn't include a check for any of the checks that were in uh, libpng, then I'd, uh, I'd find it and uh, it would break. So in multiple cases, we were able to break a new implementation just by trying test cases that hit the, uh, the checks in one implementation. So if they hadn't considered this case, then that would just crash straight away. So um, I've had dozens of cases where building a corpus with an open source implementation would just crash every proprietary implementation I could find. So I generated test suites for most image formats. Um, with uh, the uh, standard open source libraries like libpng, libjpeg, uh, and uh, libgif, and so on. And then opening uh, the test suite that I generated with things like Photoshop, Acrobat, uh, most web browsers, um, Windows, uh, the Windows image codecs, all of them would just break straight away. Um, most of these, are, unfortunately, are still patched, so I can't really give full details at the moment. And I've had to censor some of the details, which kind of sucks. But uh, eventually, they'll be, they'll be patched. Uh, they will be reported. So. One of the problems with this uh, was I still felt that uh, basic, basic block-based coverage uh, was still holding me back. The problem with, uh, the problem with, um, uh, the, problem with uh, these, uh, basic, basic block-based coverage is that um, a basic block can still encode quite a lot of logic, and it's difficult to explore the logic within, this, within these basic blocks. So um, I solved this problem using, with a technique I called sub-instruction profiling. Um, all existing coverage-driven fuzzes based, uh, use, at best, basic blocks um, to determine code coverage, uh, but we felt this was still too high level. Um, so, yeah, basic block uh, coverage is equivalent to instruction-level coverage, but you can still imagine how a large amount of logic can be coded into a single instruction, and basic block-based coverage tells you nothing about this. So, for example, if you've got a program that just does, that has a, a struct comp, um, um, any reasonable compiler is going to encode this into a repz compass instruction. Um, so even though this is in another basic block, it, it, you're not learning anything being told that this basic block is going to hit a particular program. It doesn't matter what, um, what I put in there, it's not going to work. So, um, so yeah, most compilers are going to uh, optimize this into a branch to subroutine. And then, uh, so basic block based coverage is telling me nothing. All I would basically know that a string was compared. I don't know what the string, how uh, close the string was to the original string or anything like that. So the basic block-based coverage is hiding a large amount of program logic. Um, Feedback-driven fuzzes that use basic block execution, which is essentially all of them, um, are never likely to, to proceed past a check like this. They just basically don't know, they don't have any feedback about how far they're progressing into the comparison. Um, so unless you're, you uh, pre-populate or seed your fuzzer with, uh, uh, with, uh, uh, with some of these strings or some of this logic to, to bypass a check, you're just never going to hit it, basically. It's, it's going to be impossible. And you can imagine the same thing with uh, simple integer comparisons. Like a comp any compiler is going to turn this into a 32-bit comparison. 
Um, but unless you've got this constant or your program knows how to make, uh, uh, your fuzzer knows how to uh, pass this check, it's just not going to happen. So uh, yeah, even significant, even simple arithmetic operations can be hiding significant program logic, and uh, a basic block based coverage is not going to tell you anything about this. So sub instruction profiling is my solution to this. Um, so I solved this problem uh, by using DBI to instrument these routines. Um, so using PIN, this is relatively easy, which is what my current implementation is written in. Um, PIN will let you know when, um, when you've uh, encountered a new basic block that hasn't been hit before. And then you can examine the, the basic block and install some instrumentation data. So basically, I, uh, I take the existing uh, uh, code coverage score based on basic blocks. And then I, um, I, uh, I, uh, I uh, add on to that a new deep coverage score, which uh, looks deeper into the instructions and assigns a coverage score based on how, how deep, for example, you got into a comparison or how deep you got into a, um, a string comparison or things like this. So considering the first example, you can, improve, you can improve the feedback of that simply by installing some instant patient data, in data that com, uh, compares the, uh, the value of ECX before and after the comparison. Um, this way, you can see how far into the comparison you got before the, before the operation uh, gave up. Um, I can, I, can improve the, uh, um, I can improve my understanding of the 32-bit uh, immediate comparison by breaking that into 32-bit size chunks. And then I can assign uh, a score based on how deep into that comparison I got before uh, uh, an incorrect bit was encountered. So this has proven to be pretty useful. Um, because as I mentioned, I've, been, I've tested PNG decoders. As, in, uh, as I'm sure most people know, PNG includes a CRC on each chunk of image data. Um, in several cases, um, I found that uh, you can't hit a bug unless the PNG matches. Um, so your only options are really to, you know, to re if it's proprietary, is to reverse engineer it, find the location of the comparisons, and patch them out. Or uh, you can use uh, this sub-instruction technique, which, will, uh, which can essentially fuzz its way through these. So if, I'm, if, uh, if I encounter this problem, I can break the CRC32 into a bit size, into bit size manageable chunks. Um, so originally, I, I, was, I thought that using Hamming distance was probably the best idea, but it turned out that this was easily susceptible to local minima, and it would just reach like eight bits correct, and then it would never get past that. So it turned out the better solution was just to do uh, um, perhaps the obvious solution is just uh, counting uh, correct bits starting from the MSB until an incorrect bit is accounted, and that's your coverage score for this instruction. Um, now I can use this feedback in this uh, in this instrument comparison to uh, let the fuzzer know how deep it's getting, and uh, now it knows when it's got when it's reached a new bit that it, it should uh, it should uh, start uh, trying to find uh, more based on this, and then continue until it's reached past it. And this way, I was able to reconstruct CRC 32s without any knowledge of the CRC 32 algorithm or any understanding of what I'm doing. It's not important. I just have to know that I'm getting deeper into this uh, into this comparison than I was previously. Um, okay, so. Perhaps the classical solution to this problem is just using constraint solving. Uh, and people have implemented this, including Fuzz Grind, which is based on Flare, which is uh, our project, and Sage, which is Microsoft Research. Um, they use constraint solving to try and work out whenever they hit a point, how do they reach this by go going back through the, uh, the, uh, the, the code path and working out how to get there, or seeing uh, the future code paths and working out how to get there. It's, uh, it's a very nice and elegant solution, but the problem is that uh, it's very slow. Um, most implementations are, um, sometimes uh, give up after a certain amount of time, and it's just, uh, it turns out that even though it's very elegant and nice and perhaps the correct computer science solution, it just isn't very practical in my experience. And I found that I can get uh, uh, similar uh, results with better performance, it's just using stochastic hill climbing and this sub-instruction uh, profiling technique. So um, basically I try to get deeper and deeper coverage into it, and whenever I reach a new bit, when I ever get a new correct bit or correct byte correct, I just uh, restart the process and start hill climbing again, which is uh, uh, reasonably easy to implement, and it works. It uh, works and performs uh, just as well as uh, constraint solving techniques that I've seen. Um, so I've experimented both. I work on Flare, and other tools have uh, allowed us to evaluate it. And uh, I'm pretty sure that the, that uh, we're onto something here. We've uh, we've uh, we've got some good results, and it's uh, been working really really well. So. Um, yeah, so practical solution, uh, practical experience suggests that this, is, uh, this uh, constraint solving, although it's more elegant, performs poorly and produces no better results than uh, sub-instruction profiling. So uh, my implementation of uh, sub-instruction profiling is called Deep Cover. It's currently using PIN. Uh, but now that Dynamo Rio has been released under a really favorable license, that I plan to port it and, uh, and make it available uh, under using this license. Um, 
so I've been using this technique to, to, uh, to make large amounts of uh, uh, logic uh, much simpler and make everything uh, more uh, uh, fuzz friendly. Uh, and we've been able to break some surprisingly complex logic using the, these simple, te uh, simple mutation techniques and uh, some feedback from, uh, from our program. Um, so I've eliminated, eliminated uh, constraint solving from, uh, from my fuzzing, which I've considered a major bottleneck for a while. And in lots of current research that uh, plug constraint solvers into fuzzing, I found that, that uh, this, is, this is a bottleneck holding them back from, from uh, really uh, uh, um, finding some excellent results. Um, so I've, got, I have, I've had some demonstrations, but unfortunately I've had to switch laptops and my demonstration won't work here, but um, I've been able to find some really amazing bugs using this technique. Um, I've been able to find uh, remote ring zeros in Internet Explorer, for example, because it exposes, uh, as Microsoft puts some of the uh, image handling uh, uh, code into GDI, which is uh, inserted into the kernel. Um, I've been able to just visit a simple web page, a web page and uh, have it find uh, remote ring zero exploits, um, that, uh, which are currently being, uh, uh, I've reported to Microsoft and I think they're going to be fixed this Tuesday or maybe uh, next past Tuesday or something like that. Um, uh, so Flayo is um, um, a framework that I've been working on with Will Drury at Google. It's based on Valgrind Vex and uh, basically the idea of Flayo is uh, to instrument programs at runtime and strip away the, uh, the complexity of the protocol so basically, so it looks no different from, uh, from dev you random. Uh, so we did this by, define, by extending the divineness check that's used by memcheck and others. If you use Valgrind, do you know that it, uh, it prints out uh, if you've uh, touched uh, undefined memory? Uh, it lets you know the address of that, and we, uh, we extended that check to, to essentially taint any input that, attacker can, that an attacker can control. So Flayo takes a regular application that passes some complex data, and it essentially, it'll make dev you random an effective fuzzer. So you can just pipe dev and into, uh, I don't know, Apache, and, and it'll find bugs. Um, so at the moment, this is a very manual process. Uh, we published the, this idea in uh, Usenix, and uh, others have extended the idea, such as um, uh, people have added constraint solving into it and things like this, and uh, we think there's really some exciting potential um, uh, and, uh, uh, for more research in this area. Um, so how does Flayer work? It taints the, the, uh, the user input and it traces its flow through the application uh, with bit level precision. Uh, so Flayer uh, monitors when a tainted condition is tested and it, it can tell whether the path should be taken or not. Because it's using DBI, you can flip the condition, condition and choose which path to take. Uh, so Flayer knows when an application is making a decision based on something that an attacker has provided it. Um, so we implemented some simple heuristics and um, and now we can make it decide whether an uh, uh, whether an attacker should have taken this code, whether the code should take this code path or not. And uh, so we can explore even more uh, uh, at the program. And uh, this way, we try to reach as much program as possible using coverage data. So we've found major vulnerabilities uh, using this technique in things like OpenSSL, OpenSSH, uh, libtiff, libpng, and uh, lots of others. Uh, so Flay just basically strips away the protocol and making uh, DevU random an effective fuzzer. Um, we've uh, been combining these th techniques together to uh, really get some excellent results. And uh, we think this is, uh, especially DBI fuzzing in general, is a really exciting research area um, uh, with lots of cool stuff going on at the moment. Um, so unfortunately, I, I had some demos to show, but I can't show them from my laptop. Uh, so that's the, <laughs> I'm afraid that's the end of my presentation. Uh, okay, that's it. Process. Um, we define the instructions that we that we know how to handle um, right. uh, in our fuzzer. Yeah, so things like comparison, integer comparisons, okay. uh, uh, string comparisons, anything like this. We uh, we search the whenever we hit a new basic block, right. uh, we analyze the basic block and look for any instructions that we know how to handle. and We can assign a deep instruction uh, coverage score to. Okay. Anyone? Else? Okay. Deal. So, um, when you're looking at solving that CRC um, problem, figuring out CRC um, what are the optimizations that you can add to your visual code? Obviously, probably what's the difference? Look one bit, find a bit further, look at the rest. So, run it in, you can see that. So, um, so, not really. We were basically using very naive hill, uh, just simple hill, hill climbing. We were determining when we we're hitting a new code. 
and then uh, there, there wasn't any uh, logic uh, embedded to handle this. It would basically just magically work. It was uh, it found some really cool stuff. Yeah. So it was kind of unexpected that we would bypass CRC32 jacks. Um, but yeah, it worked. Anyone else? OK. Oh. So uh, is deep cover part of Flare now? If we download Flare, we get all this with um, it? Not yet, but eventually it will be. Um, at the moment, I am, I'm porting it to Dynamo Rio because now it's under a BSD license. So it's, much, uh, it's available to do much more stuff with it. So. Um, but shortly will be part of Flare, yes. Okay. Okay. Um, thanks very much. <laughs>